Hello, friends. Welcome back to Colliding Worldviews. It's great to have you with me here every single week. As you know, many times on Colliding Worldviews, we're talking about Islam and something that has to do with Islam. However, we do many other topics as well, and that's the case today in this and the next episode with my guest, Matt Schmidt. He is the CEO of Engage360 Ministries. You can simply go to E, the letter E, 360, use the numbers, and then m.org, and you can find out about his ministry and what they are doing there because God is using it for his glory. They are equipping churches, uh, training people in evangelism and apologetics, how to use evangelism uh, in apologetics and evangelism conversations, and that is the main goal of all Christians is getting the gospel out to the world. We know that we are called to share the gospel and defend the historic Christian faith. However, a very small percentage of Christians actually do that. And that's why it's great to have you here with us today, Matt, to talk about not only E360 a little bit, but also (laughs) about some very vital topics that I know people are going to love and it's going to help them in their discernment, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me on. Really glad to be here and uh, hoping that this is a fruitful and profitable time for all. Now, what we're talking about in this first episode is the book or the, maybe the devotional that you may yeah. have on your shelf called Jesus Calling. I mean, that doesn't sound bad when you see the title. Uh, it's nope. nice for Jesus to call people, good for the Father to call people to his Son. In the next episode, we're going to talk about hearing from God. How often do you hear people say that? So we're going to get into that and the, the good aspects and the negative aspects of mm-hmm. what that entails when people say that. However, again, in this first episode, Uh, We're talking about Jesus Calling, a a very popular book, uh, very popular like The Shack that isn't really being talked about as much today, but Jesus Mm -hmm. Calling still is. We want to talk about that. Matt, what is Jesus Calling and why is it such a big deal? Yeah, so there's – it's a book that's uh, said to be a devotion, uh, 365 entries, uh, so you can do it as as a daily devotional. Uh, it's sold over 30 million. I was trying to get exact numbers, see if I could get an update, but it's over 30 million. It's been published in many, many different languages around the world, uh, has been selling worldwide. And as you mentioned, the shack, you know, had, it, it had a lot of interest and then it kind of phased out. There's still some people here and there, but, but the Jesus calling still continues to have a lot of momentum. And if anything, maybe even gaining momentum, it's been turned into, there's a, a second, uh, devotion that's been written similar. Uh, it's been turned into a study Bible, a kid's devotion. There's all kinds of merchandise being created in conjunction with it. And so it's really, really, uh, taking a lot of hold. Uh, and the problem is, is what, what's the inspiration? What is behind it? What is it? Uh, it sounds really good. There's a lot of things about love and peace and, and joy, but is it actually, uh, healthy? Is it actually, Jesus that's talking. Matt, why this is so important, uh, very important for people to get this information, because it's it's one thing when we are talking with Christians, and uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who still don't know the differences between Christianity, Mormonism, Islam, etc. They think we all believe in the same God, the same Jesus. So, of right. course, we have our work cut out for us in explaining the differences and letting people know that it's the differences that matter, not the similarities. Now, right. it's easy in, in, in that sense to say, this is Christianity, this is why Islam, Mormonism, etc. are false. But what we're getting here today, we're getting here to today is the, the nitty gritty and not deciphering between truth and error, but truth and almost truth. And right. that's why Deception. It's, it's so much harder for uh, Christians, if, if they're maybe just a brand new Christian, or they haven't really read through the Bible yet, they don't have a systematic yep. theology of the Bible, to get pulled in to books like Jesus Calling and other things like this that right. sound right. It's not yeah. like they're, they're teaching a completely false uh, ideology. So right. very important for people to get this information. It seems clear that many people love this book, and that's the case with other books as well in the past. Uh, right. But others think that this book is, uh, has, is full of problems. Why is that? Yeah. Well, it it goes to exactly what you just said, Tony, that deception is the problem. And, you know, we're not told by Jesus, we're not warned that there will come a day when uh, everyone will only desire truth and that falsehood will be very, very, very clear and uh, deception will be so obvious that everyone will know to ignore it. It's that 
we're going to draw to ourselves things we want to hear. There's going to be people who just bring around themselves teachers that say what they want, that sound good, and that the enemy appears as an angel of light. It's not obvious, and that's the whole point. You know, I think our modus operandi in the Christian life needs to be to, one, expect suffering and challenges, and two, expect efforts at deception all around us constantly. I'm not saying every single thing, you know, your spouse says or something like that, but we should be discerning and vetting everything we accept. And that's what we need to do with this, this book, Jesus Calling. And so when we look at and say, well, there's a problem with this book, there's a problem with devotion, this devotion, I think we can break it down into three reasons. There's concerns with the inspiration behind Jesus Calling. There's concerns with the process by which she went about writing it, uh, the author being Sarah Young, went about writing it. And then there's concerns with the language that's used. Um, and, and we can get into all of those. What I want to add to what you and I just said is I, I don't make any assumptions about Sarah Young. I'm sure from the little bit I've heard of her, she's probably very nice. She may be very sincere, but that doesn't mean we have to accept everything that she says. We have to still be discerning. It's not a matter of disliking her or, or hating her. In fact, we need to love her no matter what, but we need to be discerning. So let's jump in, Tony, and talk about some of those challenges. So the, the inspiration behind Jesus Calling was actually a devotion called God Calling, uh, which I'll hold up here on the screen. This is a devotion uh, from uh, much earlier uh, in the 1900s and was written by two anonymous listeners. And essentially, uh, the summary of it would be they, they sort of went into a meditative trance together and listened and were guided into writing certain things. And they, they say, we, uh, we felt all unworthy and overwhelmed by the wonder of it and could hardly realize that we were being taught and trained and encouraged day by day by him personally. When millions of souls far worthier had to be content with guidance from the Bible, sermons, their churches, books, and other sources. So they see this as something more and beyond all of those things. And that's kind of this common theme that I think we see in people who are it's a, it appeals to or maybe even it's, it's this quasi sort of Gnostic tendency that this idea that there has to be this higher level of intimacy or spiritual uh, awareness or spiritual depth that can be attained. And so then they go on to say um, to this book, so to us, this book, which we believe has been guided by our Lord himself, is no ordinary book. So it's published after much prayer to prove that living Christ speaks today, plans, and guides the humblest that no detail is too insignificant for his attention, and he reveals himself now as ever humble servant and majestic creator. So some of that sounds good, but what, what, the, what they're saying is that G Jesus is speaking directly to them, giving them uh, these words, giving them these revelations, and what follows is much more in line with New Age thinking than it is with Christian theology, healthy Christian theology. Uh, Marcia Montenegro, who, Tony, I, I know you know her, she was in the New Age and came out of that, is now very much on the front of the New Age watch and occult movements and, and keeping tabs on what's going on there. And she said when she read this devotional God calling after becoming a Christian, because someone had given it to her, that it jumped out right away. She saw all these concepts that were just imbued with New Age terminology, New Age ideas. Um, it was uh, edited by a man named A.J. Russell, and so we have some other things that he wrote. That the, the authors of God Calling were anonymous, but the editor, A.J. Russell, we know a lot more about. And in another book, he says uh, of the practice that they used to write God Calling, he said, quote, this, is no, this was not simple meditation, which may be concentration on some aspect of Christ or the gospel, but something more. And that's what we're going to see as a common theme. It's more. There needs to be something more. It's not enough. We need more. And there could be something healthy of us saying, I need more out of my relationship with Christ. I need to know him more. I need to be more like him. But there's a point where that becomes unhealthy and we start to elevate it too much. And then we're, we're open to uh, dangerous practice. And friends, I want to let you know, too, that Matt has a master's degree in philosophy from Southern Evangelical Seminary. He's a critical thinker. Uh, I try to think, think critically as well, and he and I are both very analytic. 
And that right. comes in uh, well when you're talking about this kind of stuff. Because again, discerning between truth and almost truth and that discernment of deciphering something that sounds good, sounds right, but there's something off there. Now, if this mm -hmm. was completely out of whack, no one would even accept it at all. They say, well, no, this is completely false. But there's a percentage of truth there, and right. that is where the problem comes in. Because if you don't discern the underlying uh, conceptions of words and these statements and what they're really saying, what's underneath what they're saying, then you're not going to see the red flags here. Correct, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we have to be really discerning. So we have this concern with the inspiration. So we know that this was Sarah Young's inspiration because in the original, in the intro, she said that uh, it became a treasured possession to her. It was one of her most treasured possessions and uh, that she had been seeking. So we'll kind of go into what she says in her intro. Um, that she first experienced the presence of God in an, a setting of exquisite beauty. She was in a deeply wooded area, feeling vulnerable and awed by cold moonlit beauty. The air was crisp and dry, and suddenly she felt a warm mist envelop her. Um, I became aware of a lovely presence, and my involuntary response was, Sweet Jesus. This was totally uncharacteristic of me. I was shocked to hear myself speaking so tenderly of Jesus. She continues, um, but that she realized this was the response of a converted heart. At that moment, I knew I belonged to him. This was far more than the intellectual answers I'd been searching for. This was a relationship with the creator of the universe. And and she goes on to tell her story. Nothing else had happened for quite a while. I think it was a period of 16 years. She didn't have any other interactions. But then uh, she started to seek after this more uh, and – then goes on to talk about how she started to do visualization uh, techniques to protect her family. She would do this visual visualization, which, again, people like Marshall Montenegro, who'd been who've been intimate with the New Age, would say this is a dangerous practice, not something we should be doing. There's meditation, there's praying for protection, but doing these visualizations, having light envelop. Uh, that that's going to perhaps be more dangerous and, and that she then became enveloped by light. Um, and she says later that same year, I began reading God calling a devotional book written by two anonymous listeners. They practice waiting quietly in God's presence, pencils and papers in hand, the message, um, and they receive messages from him with I designating God. The following year, I began to wonder, too, if I could receive messages during my times of communication with God. I'd been writing prayer journals for years, but that was one-way communication where I did all the talking. I knew God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. <clears throat> Increasingly, I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day. I decided to listen to God with pen in hand, writing down whatever I believed he was saying. It felt awkward at first. But I received a message. It was short, biblical, and appropriate. And then she talks about how it how it began to flow. My journaling had changed from monologue to dialogue. Soon, messages began flowing more freely, and I bought a special notebook to record these words. This new way of communicating with God became a high point of my day. I knew these writings were not as inspired as Scripture is, but they were helping me go cl grow closer to God. And you'll see that she does try to qualify that there's a difference between Scripture and what she's saying, but. That line gets blurred so much, Tony, and it's exactly what you're saying. It's that danger of truth, almost truth, but not quite. Um, she then goes on to say, in many parts of the world, Christians seem to be searching for a deeper experience of Jesus' presence and peace. The messages that follow address that felt need. Um, I've written them from Jesus' point of view. That is, the first person singular, I, me, mine, always refers to Christ. You refers to you, the reader. So that is the perspective. And then she says, these messages are meant to read slowly, preferably in a quiet place, invite you to keep a journal to record any thoughts or impressions you received while being in his presence. So there's concerns over that background, what inspired her, what her process was, um, and that she's, she's receiving these messages supposedly from Jesus and channeling them through. And so that's concerning, that background, that process by which it was happening. This is enhanced when we have certain things uh, come up, such as changes that are made. So the edition I'm reading from is the original. Uh, references to God calling have been removed from any edition you would buy today. References to certain aspects have been softened. Um, instead of uh, – uh, or, or changed even. So in one instance, Jesus says uh, – I will be with you to the end of the age. These are the last words I spoke to you before ascending into heaven. Well, 
that those weren't the last words he said before ascending into heaven. So then it's changed in the newer editions to these are the words I spoke to you after my resurrection. Uh, Jesus also talks of being uh, born under appalling conditions and that the day of his birth was a dark night for him. So there are just these these oddities that come up, some of which are changed and softened, some of which are left. Um, and and so that, again, should start to alert us. There's something different here. We can't absolutely say this is you know demonic or this has been uh, influenced by the enemy, but we should be concerned. Matt, you've given a presentation on Jesus Calling at different conferences before. You have a PowerPoint, and I do want to get and make that PowerPoint available to our yeah. audience, either Absolutely. on um, either giving them a link or putting it on, you know, making sure that it gets put on the Radical Truth Facebook page and we let people know about this episode that we're doing today. Uh, yeah. But we do want to get that to people because you have a lot more detail on that than someone's going to get in this 28 and a half minute episode. Yeah, some of the oddities, and, and, and you're fair, you, you let people know these are uh, positive things in the book. These are things that are okay. But at the same time, you point out what is wrong. Some of those is that it seldom talks of sin or repentance. It's right. almost always peace and love. Very few mentions of Christ dying for our sins, as well as odd language for for God as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the theme seems to be much more of this, you know, God loves you. God wants you to have peace. He wants you to have joy. Now, that sounds good and less taken to a certain extreme, where then when you look at that fleshed out, what does that look like? It, it's the danger of inverting the spiritual promises God gives us and making them more physical or something we have today, and taking the physical, the, those those kind of promises of, of suffering and challenges, and then spiritualizing them away. And, and you see a little bit of that uh, so whether it's those aspects of not really focusing on sin, on repentance, on the things Jesus seemed to focus on a fair amount, and instead focusing on love and peace and joy, and then also the New Age terminology, Tony, is just really, really concerning. Uh, I'll, and I'll give you just a couple. I'll read a few, and then I'll, I'll go over some terms. So uh, on April 21st, uh, she writes uh, – well, Jesus supposedly says – let me control your mind. The mind is the most restless, unruly part of mankind. Long after you've learned to discipline holding your tongue, your thoughts defy your will and set themselves up against me. Now, this is the danger. There is some truth. That our thoughts do. Our thoughts are can be evil, right? Even, even after we're saved, it's a process of, of growing in Christlikeness, of sanctification. But – when you take it to this degree, now you're going to get in trouble here. So she continues, well, or Jesus continues, man is the pinnacle of my creation. The human mind is wonderfully complex. I risked all by granting you freedom to think for yourself. This is godlike privilege, forever setting you apart from animals and robots. I made you in my image, precar precariously close to deity. Through Though my blood has fully redeemed me, do, do redeemed you, your mind is the last bastion of rebellion. Open yourself to my radiant presence, letting my light permeate your thinking. When my spirit is controlling your mind, you are filled with life and peace. Now, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't think we should be. I don't see biblically where we are encouraged to let something take control of our mind. Now, being bridled by Christ, bringing our thoughts captive to Christ as we know from Paul, bring every thought captive, certainly. But putting our mind under the control of something else by going into a quiet meditative trance, that we are not asked to do, if anything, we're warned. Uh, another example would be July 18th, uh, where Jesus says, I am nearer, well, su supposedly, the, the Jesus of Jesus calling says, I am nearer than you think, richly present in all your moments. You're collect connected to me by my love bonds that nothing can sever. However, you may sometimes feel alone because your union with me is invisible. Ask me to open your eyes so that you can find me everywhere. The more aware you are of my presence, the safer you feel. This is not some sort of escape from reality. It's the tuning in to ultimate reality. I am far more real than the word, world you can see, hear, and touch. And then, and then he says, faith is the confirmation of things we do not see and conviction of their reality – perceiving as real fact what what is not revealed to the senses. So obviously they're trying to sound similar to Hebrews 11, 1, 1 through 3. 
But that's a misinterpretation. It's not that God is some ultimate reality and this is sort of a fake world, that this is a fake reality. And not, not that she's necessarily trying to push that far, but that's the hint. And, and that faith is tapping into that and believing not the real – not the physical world, but what's really more real than the physical world. But in Hebrews 11, what we see if you read that whole section, it's talking about believing God based on his authority. That Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That we believe that God created the universe out of things that were not seen, essentially created the universe from nothing because he said so. God's the one who told the Hebrews, the Israelites, that, that the world was created out of nothing. They didn't come up with that on their own. So it's by God's authority. It's not some sort of mystical believe something that's not there or that you can't see that really is there. It's believe God because he is the authority. So I think those are, those are big concerns. And then there's a, a whole slew of New Age terms such as material manifestation, spirit life, spirit communication, spirit kingdom, the material plane. Spirit sounds, spirit understanding, um, spirit world, co-creating with God, which is very much a new age concept. Quantum leap, which gets into the whole quantum leap into the the age of Aquarius, the 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 new age, the next age that's to come, where all of the spiritually enlightened people will be, and those that were not would be removed. And then being a channel, being used as a channel. This is used over and over in both God calling and then in Jesus calling. And then there are some other terms which are used, and the way that they're used is very similar to f some popular New Age books um, that, again, someone like a Marshall Montenegro or uh, a Warren Smith, those are that have been come out of the New Age, would, would warn people about. And so that's, those are all pretty significant concerns, Tony. And what we see here, we see aspects of the prosperity gospel, uh, thinking in, in what God has for you up the ground other than the Bible, and again, talking about you needing more than Christ, you need something more than Scripture. Those aren't enough to get you what you need to know. Again, if you're taking out the sin and repentance, pro sin, sin problem, our need to repent and put our trust in Christ, and it's more about you, it's not just aspects of the prosperity gospel here, but also, as we see, uh, not in all charismatic movements, but in a number of them, it's, it's more about an experience, and guess what? If you are not indwelled by the Holy Spirit who gives you assurance of the truth of Christianity, the truth of Christ, the truth of the gospel, you're looking for an outward experience, and sometimes that happens in the charismatic movement in one way or another, but the same thing here. You have to have a, a, a new extra-biblical experience because Scripture isn't enough, Jesus isn't enough. Now, there are a lot right. of people who've read this book they may have it on their shelf. They've been planning to read it, or they just think it is a great book. Uh, right. What advice would you give to someone who has already read it or is, in, is, or is being encouraged to read it? Yeah. So I think the first step is I hope we've raised enough concerns that you're at least going to look into it more, that you're going to take these concerns pretty seriously and take the next steps. And so there are some books, as Tony said, I'll try to make my PowerPoint available, but you can go right to some direct sources that have a lot more knowledge on it than I do. You can go to Marsha Montenegro, uh, Christian Answers for the New Age. We can probably include a link to the website there. Uh, Warren Smith has a book called Another Jesus Calling. Uh, I actually have it right here. I'll pull it up. Uh, so this, and, uh, you can get a lot from there. And again, we don't have to say that, well, whatever they say has to be absolutely true. No, be discerning with them as well, but you need to look into it seriously. And so take those steps. If you've already read it, go ahead and still do that research so that you can speak about what you've learned, how you've come out of it. And I, I've talked to people who have, uh, two stories. One, a woman in my church who had read it. She loved it. She loved how much it talked about Jesus loving us and having this deep, intimate relationship with us. But once I did a presentation that she came to and I showed all the concerns, she was just absolutely blown away. And she said she did have some concerns with little aspects of it, but overall she thought it was so good. And it was from a popular Christian publisher. So she thought, well, there's no way it could be that bad because 
this is published by a Christian publishing company, and so it must be okay. Uh, and we have to be careful. That doesn't mean it's okay. And so she has she had been giving it out to graduates. She'd been giving it out all over. And she actually went and talked to those people and presented and said, look, I need to apologize. I may have exposed you to something dangerous and unhealthy. Here's what I've learned, and I'm sorry. I want you to seriously think about this uh, because I I won't use this anymore. Another story, uh, we were doing a training um, in the Northeast and talked to a woman who had grown up in the church, walked away, had a very odd experience with a psychic in college that she was quite concerned by, had been distant from God, no interest, and then came back to her faith after her kids were born and ended up, uh, her husband was not a believer at the time. She was trying to grow back into it. And he was, you know, critiquing that you don't even know what the Bible says. And so she had committed to, I'm going to learn the Bible. I'm going to learn what it says um, because I know it has truth. And she just hadn't done that. They moved and were under uh, at a new church. And uh, she she met a woman who was a leader who said that she was uh, an expert at making disciples, uh, that growing up baby Christians and maturing them. And so this this woman I was talking to said she told the leader that she really wanted to dedicate herself to reading through the Bible in a year. She had, she had tried several times and never failed and was asking for this woman to help and mentor her in that. And the woman told her, that's that's useless. Don't bother with that. Until you've learned how to hear from hear the voice of God, you can't understand anything from Scripture. And she said, have you heard of the devotion Jesus Calling? And this, this woman I, I met at the training said, yes, I have it, but I've never read it. So she says, well, you need to read that, and you need to start a Jesus journal. And until you hear him speaking to you, you're not going to be able to get anything out of Scripture. What ensued was months and months of really unhealthy practice get with, with the woman I met at this training getting pulled deeper and deeper in. And, and Jesus calling was the, the gateway, essentially. Uh, it wasn't as unhealthy as some of the things that, that she began to be exposed to, but it was this first step. Step, and that's kind of the logical the logical path. It's not that everyone's going to go far deep into extremely unhealthy practice, but it's not for any principled reason you won't go there. And so the the concern is just why why even start? Why even expose ourselves? We have one. There's other good devotions out there if that's what you're looking for, or there's just scripture. You know, just simple plain scripture. And why not? And there hmm. are daily devotion reading plans directly from scripture. Now it may take a little more to learn some of that. There, it may not be put as simply, but that's kind of the point is yeah. it's not always going to be simple. You know, we only have about a minute left, Matt. And in our okay. next episode, we're going to get into the whole idea of hearing from God and get a lot deeper into that. But what right. final advice do you have for our viewers in regards to the book or the devotional Jesus yeah. calling? Yeah, I, I would start off maybe even just half a step back of that expect efforts at deception. Don't go through your daily life assuming everything you hear is good, assuming every Christian author, speaker, even me, myself, you know, vet what I'm saying. Don't assume that. When it comes to a specific book like Jesus Calling, look into how was it written? How was it inspired? What is the What are the words being used? Do you read something and think, there's just something off about this. Don't ignore that. Don't ignore that sense of there's something off here. Instead, pursue it and, and trust that God will give you wisdom, not direct answers necessarily, but wisdom. And that's what we're promised. And that's what we need. Amen. And friends, you can find out more about Matt and his ministry at e360m.org. Make sure you check that out. Follow them on Facebook and other social media. Matt, it's great to have you here today on Colliding Worlds. He's looking forward towards the next episode. Yes, thanks for having me on. Friends, thank you so much for being here as well. Share this with people. If they've mentioned to you Jesus Calling in any way, whether they say it's good or it's bad, this will allow them to see, okay, this is backing up why I think it's bad. Or if they think that it's good, they can watch this and then take this into consideration when they think that Jesus Calling is the best book out there. Uh, it's not better than the Bible. The Bible is what we need to be reading. And even then, I mean, yes, there again, there are percentages of truths in different things that we have out there, whether it be a song, whether it be a book, a, a supposed devotional or whatever else. But we need to be discerning. We need to ask God for wisdom and not put anything above Christ or Scripture itself. God bless you. We'll see you on the next episode of Colliding Worldviews.